I, I think that at this point we will ask, um, I don't know if Dr. Genet uh, Teshomajiru is with us and I will just uh, see if he's with us yes, and then I'll go I, ahead. I'm with you. you, I'm with you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I would just go ahead and just give you a, sh a short introduction before I ask you to come in, sir. Uh, so I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Genet Teshomajiru and he is the the deputy head of the Ethiopian Embassy in the People's Republic of China, and, and he's based in, in Beijing. Um, Dr. Jiru is um, a holder of, uh, um, he's, he's a holder of, uh, he did his PhD studies at the Center for uh, African Studies at the University of, um, of Mumbai. And he also holds a master's uh, degree with honors from the Kavot University. Uh, and that he holds in, in, in economics. Uh, and I think it's also very important to note that he's a long-standing uh, staff of um, the Ethiopian um, uh, uh, Foreign Service as he has served in various capacities and in different places. Uh, he has been the consul in Mumbai uh, of the Ethiopian uh, Consulate General there. Um, and uh, in his professional career, he has also worked as the uh, Director General of Asia and Oceania uh, directorate. So he's, um, I mean, he stands very vested in the, in the issues uh, related to migration as well between Asia and Africa. Um, uh, and at the same time, he has also worked as a director for export trade uh, uh, and foreign direct uh, promotion also within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, of, the, of the Ethiopian uh, government. He has a various interests and I think uh, we, are, we are very delighted that he could join us um, and he is joining us from Beijing, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, very interesting times, uh, just looking even at the headlines of um, uh, Ethiopia has been featuring on the headlines, trying to manage its stranded migrants in, in various places, a lot of return migration, uh, but as well as looking at diaspora, the, the importance of diaspora support. I think that has been something that's been exemplary on the continent, as well as looking at how um, Ethiopia deals with its China relations. So I would just ask Dr. Jiru to give his uh, remarks. Dr. Thank, you, thank you very much, uh, my sister. Thank you, uh, Dr. Professor Renu and uh, Professor Saho for organizing this uh, very excellent event. At this critical time when uh, African countries are uh, <clears throat> struggling to cope with uh, COVID-19, uh, this is a very privilege for us to be here and uh, discuss about uh, this uh, very pertinent issue. Uh, to highlight a little bit about Ethiopia's case, uh, the first uh, COVID uh, uh, case was reported on March 13. Uh, since then, uh, as we stand today, uh, the positive reports have been going up uh, to 5,846, uh, unfortunately 103 days. Uh, and uh, fortunately also above 2,100 recoveries. Uh, as you, uh, if we look at uh, the trend, uh, the, the situation we stand now, when, where we stand now is uh, very critical for Ethiopia because uh, what the so-called uh, community transmission is taking place currently and uh, the rapid uh, uh, dissemination or expansion of uh, the virus is uh, happening in Ethiopia. Only in, uh, in this June month, uh, around 2,000 positive cases were, uh, were recorded. So uh, this is a very delicate time for us uh, to stem the uh, growth of uh, this epidemic. Uh, <clears throat> the infection rate is about 2.3% currently. The response uh, uh, measures uh, taken by the government uh, are, uh, uh, for instance, you know, uh, the government has started taking measures uh, before uh, the positive case reported in Ethiopia. Uh, as you know, the Ethiopian Airlines was continuing flying to different countries during the epidemic period. So the government has put stringent measure of surveillance and uh, uh, health monitoring at the arrivals. Uh, so the preventive measures were uh, uh, put in place even before the positive case appeared in Ethiopia. But uh, still, uh, 
the challenges uh, we are facing uh, are uh, different. One is a uh, uh, growing trend of the positive cases. The second one is as our economy is uh, uh, very you know, fragile to cope with uh, COVID, uh, the government couldn't, uh, the country couldn't lock in totally. Uh, it, they ex exercised actually to open up the economy to operate and uh, with you know maintaining social distancing and uh, uh, specific measures uh, to hot spot to hot places uh, within even uh, the economy is operating the country has uh, uh, faced a stress on economic on its economic growth currently we are anticipating a 3% decline on economy and other uh, uh, factors related to this economic decline are like uh, debt burden and foreign uh, currency earnings fall and decline in remittance. Uh, these major uh, uh, contributors to the growth of economy have been seriously affected. So uh, the diaspora uh, have been engaging in the country. We have uh, a diaspora engagement agency, uh, which is uh, a standalone uh, an institution under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but it works, op it operates independently, focusing on mobilizing diaspora. The diaspora has, uh, has uh, contributed to the country's uh, uh, struggle against this COVID. Uh, as of uh, May uh, 5, around 100 million Ethiopian number and different equipment is, uh, which support, uh, you know, the uh, steaming of this virus have been donated by uh, Ethiopian uh, diaspora. And uh, the diaspora also expected to contribute, especially those who have uh, well experience and accumulated uh, you know, experience and capital to some extent, are uh, highly encouraged to come back to their countries, uh, to their country and invest in different uh, economic and service areas. So uh, they are uh, most welcome to invest in the country and benefit from African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which we uh, signed, uh, which we embraced recently as a continental uh, uh, free trade uh, opportunity. So uh, the support uh, from the international community or policy response from the international community is very encouraging. Uh, if we look at uh, the World Bank, uh, they have already supported Ethiopia about 86 million to you know, stimulate the economy and this, you know, fight this again, fight again as this pandemic. IMF also supported about 411 million European Union uh, and other uh, countries unilaterally or bilaterally, uh, they have supported us. Uh, United Nations supported in kind, WHO, China and other countries like Morocco, UAE, Kuwait, in different forms, you know, especially in kind to support our struggle uh, against COVID. I'm not exhaustive here. Uh, there are so many countries who have come across to support us. Uh, when we look at the government uh, response and intervention, as I tried to explain earlier, first, the government has put in place uh, the emergency response uh, committee, which is comprising uh, minister, ministers of uh, various uh, uh, sectors, uh, and it has put in place uh, mandatory quarantine uh, borders were closed immediately when uh, the uh, virus uh, started, you know, uh, appearing in, uh, in a large number. Nightclubs and entertainment outlets were closed. Uh, schools were shut down for the time being and social distancing measures uh, have been taken. As I said, uh, the, the business ha ha hasn't been completely closed, but uh, the government was uh, introducing uh, different uh, uh, protective measures, including social distancing and uh, uh, work safety uh, and health issues at, at, at the place. Uh, on the economic uh, area, the government has put uh, like uh, 300 mi million package to bolster health, health care spending and uh, 5 billion Ethiopian number uh, for aid package for emergency food support uh, and 1.64 uh, billion 
also to stimulate uh, businesses and for emergency food, food distribution and healthcare support in case uh, if the virus will, uh, you know, uh, grow up and expand uh, further. Uh, some studies indicate that the virus might, might grow up to 100,000. And so the government has to make some preparation in advance. Uh, this uh, resource has been uh, allocated uh, for this purpose. And now let me speak about uh, the domestic workers uh, that are stranded in uh, Lebanon. Yeah, this is a little bit uh, complicated case. Uh, Ethiopia has a, a population stress, as you know. It is the second populous country, and the population grows is uh, more than 2.3 percent. Uh, and uh, about 60% of the population is very young, young generation, and they need uh, to get a job, a job opportunity. Uh, the government is trying, the country is trying to address this challenge. Uh, it's aware of this challenge and uh, they are doing a lot, of, uh, they exert a lot of effort to address uh, the infrastructure development, industrial parks projects, uh, construction and so on, you know, attracting foreign direct investment. Uh, in a view to addressing uh, the work shortage and job opportunity to our young generation. But uh, the demand is high and our effort is, the, gov the government effort is uh, uh, really uh, uh, some, some, somehow commendable, but the challenge we, are, we have uh, is uh, outweighing the, uh, what we are doing now. So some uh, are going to uh, find a job outside the countries. There are so many Ethiopians living in South Africa in search of job. They are going, Ethiopians are going to the Middle East, uh, basically, you know, to the GCC countries uh, in search of job. Uh, Lebanon is one of, uh, you know, the hot place, I have the hot space which, uh, uh, which is preferred by uh, Ethiopian female uh, job seekers. Uh, you know, in Gulf and uh, Middle East countries in general, about 280 and 200, uh, 250 and 280 uh, female uh, domestic workers are going annually. Uh, some indicate, some studies are indicating this. Uh, and in Lebanon currently, about 180,000 uh, Ethiopians, uh, out of which 94% are uh, women. Uh, are working there. The problem uh, in Lebanon uh, the, is that uh, the labor, domestic labor law doesn't cover uh, the migrant uh, domestic workers and they are left to the kafalas. Uh, kafalas are employers who sponsor the migrants. So uh, the kafalas can do whatever they want uh, because if they deny uh, their sponsorship, this migrant do not have the status, the status of migrant. So they are exposed uh, uh, to gender-based viola violations, uh, including physical and sexual abuses. Uh, this is uh, going on for a long time. Discussions are still going on, uh, but uh, unless we address the uh, job challenge, you know, job opportunity as a country, this uh, problem cannot be addressed. Uh, regarding the current uh, situation uh, where uh, domestic uh, workers are stranding in Lebanon, uh, the government has uh, uh, tried to uh, take out uh, about 650 domestic workers from that country. Uh, in total, uh, between uh, uh, April 1 and June 10, uh, we, together with uh, IM, IOM, 15,300 uh, Ethiopians have returned to, back to Ethiopia. And still, we, the government is working with partners to evacuate uh, the rest uh, domestic workers. Uh, but uh, still, the, the, the discussion and the process is going on. Uh, ultimately, of course, they will be, uh, uh, they will be uh, taken back home. Regarding Yemen, Yemen uh, is now, as you know, uh, has been devastated by a civil war and has become uh, a safe haven for uh, traffickers. Uh, you know, he, uh, Yemen is a uh, traffickers' route 
basically those who would like to go to Saudi Arabia, again, for job opportunity, especially if irregular migrants, they, they fall under the trap of traffickers. So, uh, <clears throat> and these traffickers have got Yemen as a, uh, as a, <clears throat> is, uh, as a safe haven because uh, the situation in, uh, in uh, Yemen is uh, very f uh, fertile for them. Uh, so most migrants hoping to get in Saudi Arabia and for the work of, uh, uh, for the search of work, they fall under the trap of this uh, people. So ultimately what we should do is uh, we should address the employment opportunity, job challenges, otherwise uh, we cannot address this problem. Uh, to address uh, these challenges, we have to work with uh, locals, uh, creating awareness, and the local governments are doing this. Uh, you know, some of even uh, uh, some of these migrants do not know that Yemen is under war, and without you know uh, having known this, they fall in trap of you know in the middle of the war of. Uh, uh, between you know Hutus and uh, Saudi-led uh, uh, militants. So, <clears throat> well, Dr. Jirma, can you give you one uh, minute to wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, I'm already concluding. Uh, the to address these challenges, the main thing is that the country should pursue on its economic development and economic economic advancement the infrastructure development, industrial parks, and attracting foreign direct investment. Uh, these are very critical, you know, to create job opportunity, employment opportunity for our nationals. Uh, and COVID-19 has created a challenge in this. Uh, so we are hoping to overcome the situation and uh, finally, you know, uh, post COVID to revive the economy and uh, Great employment opportunity for this uh, national. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jiro. Very insightful, and I think uh, for for many of our audience who uh, who are here, it's 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 really very interesting to hear not just the intergovernmental um, coordination that's happening in Ethiopia in terms of managing uh, the pandemic, but also you know in terms of how um, the Ethiopian government is responding uh, in terms of consular support for stranded migrants um, in, in various parts. And the numbers seem quite huge. The numbers seem quite huge. So we appreciate that that could be quite a challenge. I think it was also very interesting to hear about the diaspora engagement, um, as you mentioned it, uh, and also to see the wide range of partners. Uh, and there we see a lot of South-South cooperation and hoping that there is a, a, a bigger future in that one. Um, our 